Well, I appreciate you uh, watching, listening, joining in. It's good to be together. And uh, I thought today I would take this question from Diane. Uh, would you speak to the biblical model of a local church body, more specifically on the subject of church covenants? Uh, the seminaries seem to be losing their focus, and it seems like some churches led by younger staff have uh, church covenants, which involve strict oversight of members and fencing the table, uh, quote unquote, of the Lord's Supper. Uh, one church I know of promotes the belief that a local church body should have only one service that uh, all members attend, to, uh, members attend together. Using Ephesians 2.15 to justify that belief, since Christ created one new man, we should strive to pursue unity, meaning all members together in one service, and that uh, congregation has been given the keys to receive and release members. Uh, this interpretation of the local church doesn't quite square with what I read in New Testament scripture. I'm told that these ideas are implied, but they just don't add up. Uh, the Holy Spirit seems to be left out of the equation. I would value your assessment of this local church model. Thank you, and may God continue to bless you and your family. Diane, well, uh, Diane, God bless you and yours as well. Okay, well, this is an interesting question. Um, so let me, uh, uh, let me. there's a few things here actually too. So let me do my best to try and speak to them. Uh, first off, the idea of a church covenant. This is not the concept of covenantal theology, which is in distinction from like dispensational theology and some of those things. Covenants in this context would speak to the idea of an agreement. The idea of an agreement between a church body or you know, essentially um, as, as defined by its leadership, uh, and its members, an agreement that members will hold to certain uh, doctrinal positions consistent with that which is taught in the church, uh, that they agree with those doctrinal statements in such a way as if they don't, then they can't necessarily acquire full membership, which means maybe they can't go to congregational, um, you know, like business meetings, board meetings, or, or, or however they might function in that capacity. Uh, they don't have the ability necessarily to serve in, in ministry in general, or maybe some ministries. They couldn't become an elder in that church. Uh, if they don't uh, agree to that covenantal, uh, those those uh, doctrinal positions, or not just in terms of their orthodoxy, but even their orthopraxy, the idea of how you live out those doctrinal positions. If there there may be some expectations that are built into the covenant of that church. Now, in regard to things like fencing the table at the Lord's Supper, what that would speak to, if I'm understanding uh, correctly here, Diane. Uh, that would speak to the idea that only members of that church or in that covenant uh, agreement, those who have agreed with that covenant, uh, whether it's verbal or signed or however that church would do that, uh, if you have not joined that church and agreed to its covenantal position on, on its doctrinal stances and all that kind of thing, then you can't participate in the Lord's Supper uh, as one of those restrictions that is for members only. Now, there, uh, part of the reason for that, I, I, I want to at least acknowledge uh, that the value in one part of the thinking of that, uh, and that is in, uh, like, for example, in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul addresses the idea of the believer's conduct at the Last Supper, uh, or not the Last Supper, but at, at communion time when they're commemorating the Last Supper, um, and they're, they're joining around the, the table for this. Uh, they were doing so in an unworthy manner, in a very disrespectful way, many of them. Uh, and so Paul, uh, to their shame, kind of called them out for that. Well, uh, a church that holds um, that uh, only its members can participate in communion in that fellowship um, are doing so oftentimes because um, they want to make sure that the Lord's table is respected. And if they don't know you well enough or you, they feel like you may hold some views that are not lining up with what they believe to be sound biblically, then they, they want to prevent people from uh, disrespecting the Lord's table. That's not a bad thing in itself. The concept of, of preserving the purity of, of, of commemorating the, the, the Lord's Supper. Um, but there are, on the other hand, also abuses of that too, where some churches feel that they have a very singular possession of what is true. And if you're not part of their body of churches, then you are maybe not even saved just by virtue of that. Uh, that that's unhealthy that or that can be unhealthy I, I would say it, it is unhealthy for for any body of churches to feel that 
like they're the only ones uh, going to heaven, they're the only ones who uh, are, are genuinely saved and all that kind of thing. Uh, the body of Christ, or those who have put their trust in Jesus, who are born again, uh, are baptized into one universal body of Christ, all believers. Um, uh, so one particular denomination or uh, group of churches doesn't necessarily have the market cornered on what it means to be the body of Christ. And so um, so there can be abuses of that, but uh, I, I will grant that that on one level, there's there's in many cases the attempt to just maintain the purity of the the Lord's table, and so there's something to be, I think, acknowledged in that. Um, but again, it can go too far, I think, too. Now, the other part of the idea of a covenant there is that if you agree with the covenantal position of that church, in other words, you agree with its doctrinal positions, uh, you agree with its uh, the way that it believes that that should be lived out, if you agree with those things uh, and you sign that covenant, then you have kind of knowingly joined into that. And, and if you don't believe that anymore, then you should leave. Um, I will say, as a body of churches, Calvary chapels uh, that I belong to, um, I belong to this movement and have for 30 years. Uh, I, uh, I, we don't use that kind of terminology. We don't really have a formal membership per se. Uh, it's not to say we don't have a directory and we don't have contact information and we don't, uh, even beyond that, more seriously in, in the, uh, with, the, with the idea of a covenant, we do have distinctives. There are things that make a Calvary Chapel a Calvary Chapel as opposed to uh, a Baptist church or a Pentecostal church or a Presbyterian church or something like that. We do hold... Um, you know, uh, um, you know, certain things that you know, are, are are particular to Calvary chapels, our our government style, our views on eschatology, uh, uh, you know, in terms of cessationism and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we're non-cessationists and that kind of thing. So there are things that you know, when you go to a Calvary chapel, if you know what they are, then you kind of know what you're getting yourself into. If you go in there and if you decide that you want to sit under that pastor's teaching and you want to be part of that fellowship then you are part of the church. You know, that's that's basically about as far as we go in regard to things like membership. We don't, again, typically use those kinds of terms. But that's not to say that covenants are necessarily uh, automatically wrong or bad. It just means that there's a church has a particular view and it's important to them that their members kind of walk in essentially in lockstep with that. And so if you agree with those things, then okay. If not, then you should probably look for a different uh, body of, of, fellowship, of churches and such. Now, in regard to the question of having strict oversight of members, um, that is a bit of a, uh, of, a, of a murky kind of an area because on the one hand, um, there is a, a recognition of, of church leadership in a body of believers. There are different styles of church government in regard to uh, maybe an elder-led church uh, or a, a single pastor-led church or a congregational-led church and that kind of thing. Um, and there are, there are, you know, you can evaluate the pros and cons of any or all of those different approaches, but in any of those situations, there is some acknowledgement of church leadership. And so how church discipline is carried out would fall into those kind, that kind of a category. How do we deal with that sort of thing? Um, and I think the Bible speaks to like the process of church discipline, but in terms of whose hands is that responsibility for discipline in, that again would depend on your uh, approach to church government. Um, so uh, having said that, and having used the word responsibility now, I want to just say that in my view, um, while on the one hand a pastor has, uh, you know, as the scriptures would would you know both state clearly, but also imply in the things Paul would write to, say Timothy or Titus, there is a role that a a pastor, uh, or to use the language there, a bishop or an overseer would have, uh, but that authority really is something that is packed into the idea of responsibility. In other words, uh, church leaders should not be authoritarian. Those who have authority in a church, a church's government structure, should not be authoritarian. Uh, there was a an early church father, and I, I just as I'm saying this out loud, it kind of came to mind. I, I, I feel like I want to say it was Irenaeus, but I, I, I don't recall exactly. But, but uh, it may have been Tertullian even, but Tertullian came later. I feel like it was earlier than him. But there was a question of, um, you know. Uh, of of how highly a pastor would be regarded, and this church, uh, this church father, this this uh, leader, believed that a pastor should be listened to unquestioningly. 
Uh, and part of the thinking of that was the newness of the body of Christ and the idea that there was a, a strong desire to protect against heresy and all that kind of thing. Well, the idea of consolidating authority in such a way as to um, to to make it understood that people in the body held that leader's word in such a way as to uh, have authority in any circumstance and you couldn't really question it. It's understandable where that thinking may have evolved from. However, uh, the the potential for abuse of that is obvious and has been demonstrated through the years in many different contexts of, of, of all kinds of different denominations and non-denominational churches and that. So uh, I think in regard to this question of having a tight, uh, strict, as the word, oversight of church members, we want to be a little careful as leaders that we don't become authoritarian and and as a, as a word to people sitting in the pews, as it were, uh, you have a responsibility not, uh, you know, you have responsibility, I should say, not to just uh, assume that your pastor is beyond question in every circumstance. There should be a healthy respect between, um, you know, to borrow a, a phrase, parsons and persons. Like there ought to be a, a recognition that there should be a two-way respect there, uh, a genuine love uh, of Christ and the church and that kind of thing. But... Um, people that sit in the in the seats ought to know that that they do have a right and a responsibility to question if a pastor is teaching something unbiblical or if he's living in such a way that uh, the scriptures speak against and is dishonoring to the Lord and such. Um, in regard to teaching in that, uh, the Bereans famously in Acts 17 didn't just take what Paul said and just you know, no, no question, but they actually searched the scriptures to make sure that these things were so. And the Holy Spirit commends them as being noble for this. And so uh, that's, a, that's a good um, precedent to set for those who are sitting listening to, the, to any Bible teacher, myself or anybody. Uh, the Apostle Paul was not above question. Um, so, you know, if that is in place and there is sort of this sense of accountability, the, the, the members of a, of a body to the, the rest of the members and the leadership and the leadership being accountable uh, to other leaders, but also to the body itself, I think that's a very healthy place to be. Um, so, so uh, you know, my, my common, my recommendation would be don't allow yourself to be under an authoritarian thing. Now, what I'm not saying is that the guy is teaching the scripture faithfully and the scripture bring convic brings conviction to you and you don't like it. Well, too bad. I mean, that's, you should submit to the conviction of the Holy Spirit as the scripture is taught faithfully. Now, sadly, there are sometimes, um, you know, um, pastors who maybe aren't interpreting passages faithfully and biblically. But again, that becomes our responsibility to search the scripture and to question those things, to do so in love and charity and such. But if, it, if it's wrong, then we need to address those things. Now, in regard to, just by way of example, uh, Ephesians 2.15, speaking about the idea that churches, uh, or that church at least, should only have one service because Christ has brought one body together. Um, I'm going to assume that they don't that they're not approaching that as a doctrinal position, although they might be. If they are, then that's a misunderstanding of Ephesians 2.15. Uh, I'll, I'll invite you uh, to read chapter 2, uh, say verses 11 through 18, where Paul talks about, where the passage is clear, what Paul is talking about, the idea of Jews and Gentiles no longer being separate, but now being a new entity, the body of Christ. And so, um, there is no longer um, this separation between the two, but the Lord in, you know, has, has now uh, brought them together as one body in Christ. Uh, that says nothing about the idea of, of a church service. Now, if they are saying that as a reflection of that or in commemoration of that concept, we want to have one church service where everybody's together as a matter of practice that we'd like to do, sure, okay, that's just a preferential thing. If, however, they're saying that the scriptures imply that that passage should mean that churches should only have one service that everybody's in, that's a completely misguided understanding uh, of a passage and certainly does not um, uh, in any way reflect what Paul was trying to say. Uh, on a practical level, the church couldn't do that uh, in the first century. It was illegal. They, if they met in large settings all together and every believer in a particular city came together, and who's to say it was limited to just the city? Every believer in the world at that point should have come together if that line of thinking is to be followed. 
Uh, it just wasn't practical, and it also was even dangerous in those days. And so you didn't really have large church gatherings. I think the earliest one is recorded in um, in like 200 AD or so. And so it's uh, that just wasn't the norm. It wasn't their thinking, and it wasn't even contextually anything that Paul was beginning to speak to in Ephesians chapter 2. And so um, if that's what they're saying, he was saying, then that's misguided. That's not true. But I, I, I doubt that they're really taking a hard doctrinal stance on that and pointing that passage saying this is God's will for every church to have one service. Uh, that that does seem a little, uh, a little odd. But um, really, if you want the model for what the church should be, um, I think the best example of this would be Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 through 47. Um, let me read it to you if you're unfamiliar with it. Um, in Acts chapter 2, 42, uh, this is now coming on the heels of, uh, of the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit's been poured out. Uh, the disciples and the 120 come out of the upper room and they're speaking in tongues, glorifying God. People from all over the known world had come to, uh, Jer- to Jerusalem for the feasts and they're, they're hearing the, the wonderful glory and worship and, and great things of God. And so they're, they're responding to this and saying that the apostles are drunk and, and Peter goes on this wonderful uh, first sermon of the church and quoting from Joel chapter two and now in the last days and all this is going on. And, uh, and now in, in, in follow-up to that, uh, Luke records this starting in verse uh, 42, after 3,000 souls were added to their number and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. Uh, and then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, uh, all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor uh, with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, uh, those uh, who were being saved. And so you have this uh, wonderful uh, model being laid out to what the early church's life was like. They gathered from house to house, they met in the temple area, and they gathered around the apostles' doctrine, which is to say teaching. They, they sat and they listened to the apostles' teaching. Uh, they also um, uh, fellowshiped together, that koinonia, that, that Greek term that speaks of the idea of becoming one with your fellow uh, members of the body of Christ. They broke bread together, which meant they ate meals together, but also likely means they, they, had, they uh, shared the Lord's Supper together. And also they prayed together. And they did this on a daily basis. Their whole life was built around the idea of coming together as the body wherever they could in people's homes and all this kind of thing. And God was adding daily such as should be saved. And, and I take at least from that, uh, among just the, the explanation of how the church began to grow, also the fact that the Lord is tipping his hat to that model, the idea that they focused on the four basic essential um, fundamental legs to the stool and the church was hel- uh, healthy and grew and all this kind of thing. Uh, and so if you want a model for the church, that's the model for the church, uh, including the fact that they even met home in homes. Uh, I think that that certainly gives the nod to home small groups, but in my personal view, I think that as we get closer to Christ's return, the idea of house churches is going to take on a far greater importance and is going to become far more common uh, if if larger gatherings are not really able to happen. Um, if if in the in these in this century we become much more like the first century in regard to persecution and those kinds of things, then we should be thinking in terms like they did, and uh, and not feel like we can't be in fellowship if we're just in maybe five or 10 meeting in a home or, or six or eight coming together, fa- a couple of families together, uh, opening the word of God together, breaking bread, praying, being in fellowship and such. Uh, these are all legitimate expressions of the body of Christ. And so um, that's the model. As a matter of fact, um, you know, not to go on too long, let me kind of begin to bring this in for a landing. Um, you know, First and Second Timothy also give us some particular instruction in regard to uh, um, appointing pastors and deacons and, and you know those kinds of things, the roles and responsibilities of various people in the context of the church gathering. This is uh, instruction that Paul gave to Timothy. And we also not only read 1st 2nd Timothy, but I would inc- obviously include Titus as one of the pastoral epistles. But Paul writes this to Timothy in 1st Timothy chapter 3. 
In verse 14, he says, uh, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Now, when he said the church, he's not talking about the church building per se. He's talking about within the body that meets in whatever capacity they meet. Uh, his instruction to Timothy, again, in First, Second Timothy and also in Titus, we see his instruction to Titus, another pastor uh, there in Crete, uh, whereas Timothy was, um, at least some of the time, was in Ephesus. And that seems to be where Paul is encouraging him to stay and to continue to, uh, to build the body there. These were pockets of believers all over the city, just like in any city where the gospel had come and people were getting saved. Uh, They had, uh, you know, in Ephesus, there could have been 20 churches in Ephesus that each had leaders. We know there were more than one because Paul called these Ephesian elders to himself before he ultimately departed in order to impart one more time to them and warn them about the coming uh, wolves that were going to come in and seek to devour the sheep. And uh, Acts chapter 20 warns them. So we know there were groups of believers all over the city and their leaders came together uh, to meet with Paul before he left. And so um, those, those churches were ultimately then overseen uh, 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 by Timothy and such, and, and the instruction on how to do that is given to Timothy in 1st, 2nd Timothy, and similarly uh, Titus when he was in Crete. And so um, we want to make sure that on the one hand that we do uh, establish leadership in the church and that we want to make sure the church functions uh, in, in an orderly way, uh, in a way that promotes the growth of the saints, uh, in a way that uh, has the glory of God, uh, the, the uh, uh, exalting of Christ, the openness to the Holy Spirit, um, um, guiding and leading the church uh, into all truth as Jesus promised. Um, if, if, uh, you know, um, uh, if a church becomes so locked down and systematized that it doesn't really become uh, it just it just becomes rigid and doesn't really allow the Holy Spirit, um, you know, to to move in in the midst. I'm not even talking about charismatic gifts or something. I'm just saying there's no freedom for the Holy Spirit to uh, you know to be present among the the gathering of the saints in that. I mean, this this now becomes more of a, an institution rather than a body, and we want to be a little careful about that kind of thing. Uh, I think it's important for the the leadership of a church to uh, have very close, uh, consistent relationship with the body. Uh, I think if a church does get too big where they can't do that effectively, then they should think about maybe uh, how to address that and, 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 and make sure that something is in place so that it doesn't just become an institution. Um, because uh, you know, for us to grow together in the body and to do so in a healthy environment is very, very important. And, uh, and so it becomes the, the leader's responsibility um, to, to, to do their best to shepherd the sheep of God in a healthy way, leading them beside the still waters and the green grasses. In other words, feeding them and tending to them and making sure they're healthy as under shepherds of the Lord. And so uh, the idea of, of uh, sort of uh, strictly um, uh, overseeing everything, um, I guess I'll say one other thing in that. There was a movement years ago uh, called the shepherding movement uh, where, and I'm not accusing this church of doing that. I don't know this church. I don't know who's being referred to here. But an extreme example of strict oversight was the shepherding movement, where pastors were expected to give instruction to the members of the body on everything. Uh, if you were going to marry somebody, the elders had to okay that. Um, if you were going to, maybe even in terms of a job change or something, you know, you want to go to the elders of the church and get their counsel on it, should you do it or not? Uh, to the point where a lot of things that, that believers should be growing into maturity to be able to make those decisions for themselves was sort of being short-circuited for the sake of the leadership having control in the name of holiness and righteousness and godliness and that kind of thing. Um, but the idea of believers growing to maturity in those uh, settings really were just sort of, sort of put on the wayside. So, you know, when it comes to, again, um, the concept of covenants, you know, church covenants and that kind of thing, or strict oversight of believers and that. Um, let me just encourage you, if you're, uh, if you're, uh, you know, if you're wrestling with that uh, as a church leader, like how far is too far, or am I, uh, am I being irresponsible, or am I maybe clamping down too hard, uh, to just simply go to the New Testament and and um, and just keep your church as simply biblical and biblically simple as you can. 
Um, and, uh, and if you're a person in that church, um, you know, just recognize that your pastor is a person just like you are. They may have a calling to, to lead that church, but they're not above question. None of us are. And so we want to make sure we have a good relationship with uh, leadership. So that if we have questions about things or we're wondering if something is really lining up scripturally, that we have an open door to go talk to them and, and uh, listen to what they say. And uh, it may turn out that when you hear their explanation and you can see their heart, that maybe it's not such a big thing. But on the other hand, maybe there is sort of an authoritarian thing happening there. And if that's the case, maybe you want to consider prayerfully finding a fellowship that isn't so, um, uh, isn't that way. And so uh, anyway, so that being said, just, you know, some things to think about, some things to consider. But again, let the word of God always be your guide in understanding uh, all things about your walk with God, including church life and what that should look like. So, um, all right. Well, praise the Lord. Thanks for uh, thanks for the question, Diane. I appreciate it, and I do hope that uh, uh, that gives a little bit of, of food for thought on this. So, Father, we thank you for uh, for the body of Christ. We thank you for the beauty of this uh, this entity, this uh, beautiful, um, grace covered but sometimes messy entity known as the body of Christ. We thank you that. Um, that people from every tongue, tribe, and nation one day will be before the throne. And certainly in our churches today, we often get to see a little version of that as we, um, as we gather from all kinds of different walks of life to worship, to open your word together, to be in fellowship, to, uh, to break bread together, to remember, uh, to do all the things that, uh, that help us each to grow and to lift each other up and, and all these things. And Father, we Thank you that uh, in spite of the fact that we're human and, and we, uh, we all have our uh, issues and problems and, and, uh, and, and such that, Father, you still, uh, by your Holy Spirit, in the midst of the believers uh, are, and, and in the process of making us more like Jesus, call us together to continue to move forward together. One day Jesus will come. We'll all go home. We'll, we'll be in your presence. We'll worship. We'll, we'll no longer really have these uh, these issues because we'll be glorified and all this kind of thing. So we're very grateful for that day that's coming. But give us wisdom, give us compassion, give us uh, a deep sense of love and uh, and fellowship with one another. We pray that, uh, as it's been said, that we would hold together in unity in the essentials and the non-essentials. We would uh, have uh, uh, um, you know um, um, you know the ability to sort of whatever the term was, but the ability to just sort of uh, enjoy the diversity of that, but also in all things to have charity, to have love. And so we just pray that, Father, we would, um, you know, reflect what Jesus said, that they'll know that we're your disciples uh, by our love for one another. And for those of us in leadership, give us a sense of uh, the responsibility, and not just the authority, but the responsibility that you've called us to uh, to wield, uh, to recognize that the goal is to be a, a faithful under shepherd, to be Christ-like, intending those that are the sheep of your pasture. And so we just pray that we'd be uh, wise that way and that we would be very Christ-like in it. And Father, for those who sit in the seats, we pray that they too would seek to be wise and to um, not be taken captive when church situations are unhealthy or uh, or they're being harmed in some uh, unbiblical way. We thank you for the conviction the Holy Spirit brings but we pray that we would not uh, allow ourselves to be um, in situations that legitimately are abusive, uh, but we would seek other fellowship, Father, and, and we would grow and just follow the leading of your Holy Spirit in that. But um, we thank you, Father. We love you and praise you for the place the Holy Spirit has, not only in us, as Paul would say, in sealing us, but also the party plays in our lives uh, in, uh, in, um, in that we are led by the Spirit, ultimately in becoming more like Christ to your glory. So thank you, Father. We love you. We praise you. We bless you. We pray for the church, universal, the body of Christ, and pray that, Father, we'd bring you glory in all that we say and do. So thank you, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have any questions, by the way, or thoughts, or comments, you can share them on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to email me, you can do that at, at info at calvarychapelfranklin.com, or as we've been saying lately, you can also go to our Telegram channel at Parsons Pad Podcast. And you can uh, interact that way as well. If you have a question or a comment, we like to post these videos and other articles and scripture and things like that there. So it's a, it's a good place to, to, to hang out with us too. So thanks for watching. We'll catch up with you next time.